Okay, so um, I've given an iteration of this workshop before as a session, and I've also given an iteration of this as a, as a longer presentation. Um, I do have a bit.ly link down here. Uh, it's capital D C E U um, hyphen and then lowercase writers workshop. That's if you want to follow along or maybe um, tomorrow or next week, you're thinking about some of the prompts we do and you want to look back and look at that. Um, you can um, use that link and it's fully accessible. All the, all the alt tags are on there and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's images in my deck, but most of them are decorative. So for brevity, I'm not going to describe the images unless they add more context to the conversation. And I want to give a shout out to Marjorie Freeman who wrote this um, with me. We, this is actually an iteration of the diversity speaker workshop in the WordPress community. And we changed it to the Drupal community and then we changed it to be a writer's workshop. So I just want to give the credit where credit is due. So Jill Binder helped us move that space from, that, from the WordPress space into this space. And then Marjorie Freeman, who worked with me at Red Hat, really put a lot of work and made it a really beautiful uh, slide deck. Um, so we lost a community member last night. I'm not sure if anybody uh, knows Hawkeye Tenderwolf, who works at Lullabot, but he passed away last night. So I want to give a little moment of pause to think about him and um, if you knew him, you knew him and he's a pretty special person. So my name is Amy June, um, all one word, title camel case, never Amy, never June, always Amy June. Um, and I go by Volkswagen Chick across all of the social media spaces, and by all of them, I mean LinkedIn and Mastodon. I recently picked up a job at the Linux Foundation. I'm on their certification team, so I help build certifications for emerging technologies. And I was on the editorial team for opensource.com before this, and this is why I give this workshop, is because as an editor or someone who enters content into a Drupal site, some of these things will really help your editor um, because technical writing isn't about rainbows and unicorns and sparkles. It's about getting the information out there in a, in a way that's easy to digest. Um, so anyway, yep, work for the Linux Foundation. Um, this is my cat spot and he's on here because if there's any typos, it's probably because he ran across the screen or something. So we'll just blame any like typos or things. Um, he's a really good guy. Um, he likes to go outside and he drools a lot. It's kind of cute. Do you ever see the movie Hooch where the dog drools and then does this? He does that. He's an interesting cat. Okay. So why this workshop? Um, what I want to help you do is I want to help you find your why. Because sometimes we need to know why we're going to write something. I want to help you find your what. What you're going to write about. Come on in. And then I'm going to help you find your words. So the why, the what, and the words of technical writing. And there's two aspects of technical writing that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about technical documentation, and we're going to talk about technical articles. Um, this is sort of a roadmap of what we'll talk about. We'll dispel some myths about why we don't write or why we don't think we should write. Um, we'll do a brainstorming activity to together. Now, I'm going to ask people if they want to share their ideas as we go. You do not have to, but if you want to, there's no pressure, you know, just to sort of share what you're working on as we go. We're going to find the why, the what, and the words, and we're going to use those five W's, and we'll talk about what those five W's are. Again, two parts of it. There's technical articles, and then there's technical documentation. And then if we have time, there's a section where I break down and we talk about the basics of Markdown and why we use Markdown um, when, we, when we submit articles, why we use Markdown because it's portable and why we don't use PDFs and Google Docs. So that, that's if we have time because it's only you know, a, 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 what, a, an hour and a half slot. Okay. So why haven't you written? Does anyone? Has anyone not written a publication before or written technical documentation? Okay. You don't have to answer the, the, the why part, but you know, sometimes people think that they're not an expert. 
That's okay. You don't have to be an expert. Everyone has an idea, a different idea of what expert means. Um, no one knows everything, and everyone has something to learn. And the more uh, you could know more about your topic than your audience does. And so, you know, when we think about articles and we think about readmes and documentation, there's the beginner, the intermediate, and the advanced. You know, and everyone has a different level of what they're looking for. Um, People will ask questions or make comments on my articles and documentation, and I'll look like a fool. This is a myth. Um, people might ask questions or have comments that you can't answer, but that's okay. You know, you don't have to know the answer to everything. Um, and your readers understand that um, not everyone knows everything. Sometimes people are worried that they, they don't have enough page views, they failed. You know, I wrote for opensource.com. We would have an article that was super intuitive and super good, but it would have 58 views. And we'd get a fluff piece that would have 600,000 views. And people would look at that and measure their worth. Well, you know what? If you reach three readers today, or three people read your configuration in your readme, that's three more than yesterday. So that's a 300% markup. Um, and you just enriched and bettered someone's life. So page views is um, kind of a weird thing. And then the last myth that we came across was um, some folks think that a how-to is the only way that you can get your information across. So we'll cover some more formats of writing when we're talking about articles and blogs um, in the coming slides. So here are a few questions to help you think. Um, and Again, no one has to answer these out loud. You know, um, just kind of think about these as we go through these exercises of what kinds of things that you're worried about, because all of us are, well, most of us are worried about something. Um, why haven't you written for something larger? Maybe you've written an article for your organization, but you haven't submitted an article for something like opensource.net. Um, maybe you've written a README in the contrib space, but not core. So um, why haven't you written for something a little bit bigger? And then if you've only written once, why haven't you written again? So why do we write? We write to share information. You know, we don't want to hold our information hostage. We want the world to know about it. Um, most of the time, um, us in open source. Sorry, I'm tripping over this wire and I wanna position a little differently. Um, we wanna promote our open source projects. We want people to know about Drupal. Remember in the Dries note yesterday, Dries talked about marketing. Well, writing an article um, is a great way, writing a case study, you know, um, converting that case study to a lightning talk. Um, improving the README so someone outside of our Drupal bubble can look at a contributed module and know what it does except and not just the name or who's the maintainer you know so it's really a marketing thing and then it helps build personal brands online you know maybe um, you're an entry level front-end developer and you're looking for a different job well you write an article that's something else that you can put on your resume you know um, if you write a readme it's something that shows up on your drupal.org profile so it really helps build your personal brand and then as you write things you actually learn as you teach you know because you're researching and you want to do the best job well we hope that we do the best job and so we learn as we write and then also we write because the more we write like say if you're from an excluded or marginalized community the more people the more lived experiences people see gives other people encouragement to write as well so the hardest part about writing is actually starting. How many of you, that blank page is like super scary? Um, but there's resources to help. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to give some resources for places that are great for first time contrib contributions for writing. I used to work for opensource.com, you know, but we all know that Red Hat doesn't care about open source, so that no longer exists. But there's opensource.net, where a lot of those writers have moved to. So opensource.net is a wonderful place to start writing. But we also have um, some community-run um, 
uh, publications, um, if you're into sysadmin, there's sysadmin signal and there's an email address to get a hold of them. Technically rewrite, it's not necessarily open source, but he is a, loves articles about what tools you use to write. Drupal Camp Asheville, we have a neurodiversity um, initiative where we opened up knowledge sharing, not just to um, doing presentations, but if you wanted to write an article, so we run articles for first timers or people who are too nervous to speak. And then of course we have the drop times that's new to Drupal um, and you just have to drop them a line. So anyway, some resources of places that you can actually submit to and get published after this. Opensource.net is new. It's the, sa it's the same as opensource.com, but community run. I wanna like really tell you folks that, that is, it's building momentum, it's gonna be great. So finding a topic. So we're gonna move into sort of a brainstorming session because I'm gonna talk a lot about different kinds of articles and different kinds, why we write a certain way, but it's easier if you have a topic in mind. So we're gonna do a brainstorming exercise. So if you have a notebook or a computer or a napkin, however you wanna like kind of write some down, down some of these thoughts or keep them in your head. Um, so, the first we're going, I'm going to help you answer the question, I don't know what to talk about. I don't know enough to give, to write. Um, um, I'm not an expert in anything. Um, if you've written an article before and you're just stuck on what your next article might be, um, we'll be looking into answering that as well. So the brainstorming is basically, you pick up as many ideas as you can. We're not looking for good. We're not looking for perfect. It's just the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's just getting all that stuff out there on paper because it might look ugly now, but in two weeks when you're looking at your notes again, you're like, oh, I really like that. Um, again, you can draw, you can do mind maps, you can um, do any format that summons inspiration. Also, if you're new to tech, um, you don't, if you don't have some of these answers yet, that's okay. Maybe you can use these prompts to imagine what your answers might be later on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read a prompt and give you all some time and then read another prompt. So it's gonna be like a little, just a little slow for a few minutes while we get all, all of our ideas down. So what is your favorite module or theme? What are some cool tricks that you use all the time? What's a really rad thing that you've created? Rad means cool. I don't know if that translates in other languages. Okay. <laughs> what was the last thing you learned or how did you learn it? And that ties kind of into the next one of what would you like to learn next? Remember we talked about how sometimes writing things is how you learn, so it helps that learning process. What do you want to learn next?
What's the biggest challenge you've had with Drupal and how did you overcome that biggest challenge? Or insert any open source technology there. How many times did you have to install that Linux box on your machine before it worked? And then not every article has to be super technical. So how has your past experience shaped who you are in your new role? People love a good personal story. Do you have any tips on overcoming the learning curve between versions of Drupal? <coughs> or insert open source project there? Any tips on the learning curves? How has AI changed the way you develop? This next one is sort of one of those insert your own Mad Libs. How is UX different from design? Insert comparisons there. I think we have one more slide worth of prompts. How does working cross-functionally, or what does working cross-functionally mean to you? How does focusing on solutions help you with your career? And my next prompt is written awful. And I look at it now and I'm like, oh. So please forgive me. Oh, well, no, the second to next one is awful. Um, how does the being the only insert person, role, whatever, in your class or your role affect your career path? So are you the only woman? Are you the only parent? Are you the only front-end developer? How has that affected being the only one in your group? Again, people love those case stories and career stories. And here's the really poorly written one. What open source technologies outside of Drupal do you use? That was a lot of words for not a lot of content. <laughs> Yeah. 
Oh, I guess there is one more slide of brainstorms. What was your first role in tech and how has it shifted? Talk about the path of where you are now versus where you came in. So I'm a hospice nurse by trade, but here I am giving a public speaking you know, thing in open source. So how did that happen? And sort of tangentially off, off of that, do you have tips for career shifts and moving roles in tech? Did you move from being a project manager to a developer or the other way around? What learning curves did you have? What are some tools that you use to help with task management? Everyone loves a good story on what keystrokes you use or what program helps you save time on your work day. And then the last one is, think about the first time you contributed to open source, you know, whether it be a co in the code base or a presentation or in a forum. Why did you do what you did that first contribution? How did the first contribution make you feel? Because that goes along the lines of the Dries note yesterday too, you know, the marketing and the telling of stories. And the more we tell our stories about contributions, the more contributors will draw in from other places. So again, I don't make anyone share out loud, but if you want to, you can. Um, How did that brainstorm feel? Um, does anyone have any ideas that stuck out to them that they'd like to share with the rest of the group? That's okay. <laughs> Again, not all of us um, get up there and, and wanna talk about our stuff. So, when I talked about the agenda, I told you that we talk about article styles um, because not everything has to be a how-to. Um, you can write different sorts of articles. So um, the first one is our introductions to and getting started. These are sort of how-tos. It's a style to use when you're talking about a topic you're very confident about. Um, if you're writing about that topic, you're introducing it and you're owning it. Um, so look at your list and think about two topics that at some point you didn't know much about, but now you have expertise in. And that could be um, a good introduction to or getting started guide. I think I have a little bit of redundancy here. I don't usually give this section, Marjorie does. Um, so this is introductions to and getting started guides. And then she has a section on how to's and tutorials. So how to's and tutorials list instructional points. You know, they're very bulleted, not a whole lot of rainbows and glitter and fluff. Um, and these are your guides with pictures and diagrams and source code, um, if you're technical or other visuals. So look at your list and See if there's two topics that you're confident that you could write or lead a how-to article.
For publications, sometimes we do lists, listicles or roundups. Um, these are pretty straightforward. They're lists, they're quick, easy reads where you share information about skimmable tricks, um, resources, you know, it could be just a roundup of articles with a one-line introduction. Um, they have a bad reputation for being clickbaity and cheap for folks. Um, for lack of a better words, but they're great to express if it's not clickbait. It's great to express, you know, a few um, insights in a very digestible way, especially um, for people who might be on public transit and they're on their phone. Listicles are real great and it takes them to other topics, you know. Um, think about that. Um, are there two... Um, are there two on your list where you have like your favorite tips or tricks that you could do a listicle article? We have personal stories. These can be your career journey. They can be how to set up your Linux desktop or as simple as what you do and why you love to do it. Are there two on your list that you can, you know, kind of create a personal story? And that moves into personal stories are kind of case studies, but on yourself. You know, if you're familiar with case studies, they're details of... <clears throat> case studies are details of a specific subject, situation, person, or occurrence. Um, are there two topics on your list that you could um, write about a specific topic, person, um, event, organization? This can be a case study. And it's funny about how much of this stuff was in the marketing part of the Dries note yesterday. Remember he said, you know, write a case study. So again, there are those details, things of the, you know, how did you set up Drupal for Chicago Parks District case study. And my friend Marjorie, who gives this presentation, loves roundup articles. Um, so roundups are usually reader favorites um, because they're like those listicles, and because they're easily skimmable and a place to get all the information and resources. But you do have an introduction paragraph that breaks down that article that you love. So you've got a little bit more information and context with, with the listicle. So are there two topics in your list that feature several products or resources in the same categories? Um, or do they have a same theme that you could write a roundup article? And sometimes a roundup article is like, say you have a, a favorite uh, periodical and you know, you're know you into um, Git. So over the year, you found five Git articles that you really like and you wanna share that, kind of break it down and write a roundup of those five very interesting Git articles. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about documentation pages because we know that they're a little bit different than our articles. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about documentation styles. Again, this is sort of a split in half conversation about articles and then documentation. We have readmes. Um, if you're familiar with the Drupal code B base, um, most projects have readmes. A lot do not have complete readmes, but a readme is a text file that describes and launches a project. Um, it's a text file written in Markdown, but we can go into that later. But it's basically human readable. You know, it's how to configure. You know, the uh, what dependencies you need, who you, who you can reach out to if you need help. Um, if you're evaluating a read a, a module, we really want the README to give you enough information to understand if it makes sense for you to um, extend your Drupal core with um, the contributed modules. So think about it when you create your own project, but again, a lot of README's are incomplete um, in a lot of the code bases. So maybe, you know, you want to get used to doing some technical writing, 
and you have your favorite module and you notice the README is lacking, you can look up, you know, the README template and kind of redo that. And that might be a good first contribution because a lot of the information is there. You don't have to do that blank page, but fill in those gaps. We have user manuals. Um, a user manual is a document provided to a user that helps using a particular system or product or service. Um, it's known as an instruction manual or a user guide. Sometimes um, in the open source community, they're called man pages, short for manual. Um, and these documents um, cover detailed information about operations, standards, and guidelines. Uh, they provide some troubleshooting. Uh, they might have some advanced functionality and more. Um, so look at your list and see if maybe you could write a user manual. Maybe you've developed a product. You know, we've had our hot water heater delivered and it's a very, there's a lot more information in that than something like a README. We have reference materials. Uh, there's various sources that provide background information and quick facts. Um, while there's all sorts of different types of resources, you've got things like atlases, you have almanacs, bibliographies, biographical resources, dictionaries, encyclopedias, handbooks, indexes, statistics, citation guides. These are all kind of clumped into that reference materials. A training manual is a set of instructions that tells users how to complete a job, process, or task. We have a lot of these in the Drupal world, and we could always use more. So a training manual. They're a little bit more in-depth. Again, you know, this is, you know, not just the introduction, but this is different use cases for your, for your particular technology. They're more of a complete instructions to complete a task, and it might have several use cases versus just the intended use case. You know, because we know that when we write a module, what we intend isn't always what the other person intends when they use the module. So it's more, um, uh, more complete. So now we're going to move into getting started. But before we do that, I did say I'd say when the top of the hour was, if you wanted to move to a different session, because this is a double session, feel free if, you, if, you, if there was a conflict to move to a different session. I will. It's OK if you do that. OK, so now we're going to find our why, our what, and our words. So this is a writer's workshop. But it can also apply to writing a pitch for a conference like DrupalCon or sharing your elevator pitch. Like people are always asking me, oh, you work for the Linux Foundation. What do you do? Well, you kind of have to practice that kind of stuff. Um, no matter what you're trying to accomplish, there's a few things that you have to think about. Um, did all those go up? Yeah. Um, what are you talking about? Who are you telling this to? And who is your intended audience? Because those might be two different things. Under what circumstances they'd use this what, the when, and the where, but this could also be where you include the how. So these are those five W's and the H. <laughs> um, I don't know if in Europe you have this, but in grade school in the United States, we learn about the who, the what, the why, the when, and the where, and then just this weird H, how. So, and it's still called a W, even though it doesn't start with a W. Um, so the following slides, I'm going to read a prompt, um, and we'll call out uh, the five W's and the H in this reading prompt. And as we go through it, this is your chance to take some of those prompts you wrote down and think about those five W's um, and the weird H. OK, so the what. What are we sharing? And can you identify the what in the following text? So I'm going to read a blurb, and I'm going to read it a few times, and we're going to look at the who, the what, the why, the when, the where, and the how in the same blurb going through. So we're, we are technical community advocates, and we enjoy using Markdown to help expedite the editorial process for our community of writers. 
Markdown helps lower certain barriers to entry by masking the complexity of technical writing and bridges the gap between technical writers and developers. It's straightforward and anyone can get started today. So what are we focusing on here? Markdown, okay. So yes, we're focusing on markdown in that statement. So the who, who are we talking to? And I'm gonna read the, 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 the text again. We're technical community advocates and we enjoy using Markdown to help expedite the editorial process for our community writers. Markdown helps lower certain barriers to entry by masking the complexity of technical writing and bridges the gap between technical writers and developers. It's straightforward and anyone can get started today. So this is kind of a trick question. Who's the who here? There could be, yeah, there's a few of them in here. It depends on what context you're using, right? So think about that. You know, it could be um, the we, me and Marjorie, we are looking for someone, but it could be the community of developers. So think about that when you're writing. Who's that who? Who are you writing to? Marjorie picked writers. So the next one is the why, you know, why do we suggest using Markdown to writers? And I'm not gonna read the prompt again because we've read it, but so in this prompt, why would a writer use Markdown? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it also, let's see what Marjorie says by masking the complexity of the technical writing, yep. And then the where and the when. Um, so when and where would we use Markdown or suggest using it to writers? And this can be just another way to explain the how um, in your subject. So when would you use Markdown? I would say you use it to help expedite the editorial process. Let's see what Marjorie says. Yep, to help expedite the editorial process. And I'm gonna give a little bit of context here for people that don't know what Markdown is. Markdown is a language that's human readable and you write, put it into an editor and it shoots out HTML. So as an editor or someone who reads, a, you know, maybe it's a marketer, I can read a markdown file. It's got a couple of hashtags and a couple of bullet points and stuff like that, but I can tell what's written, whereas someone submitted that same thing in HTML, I'd be at a loss. Also, as an editor, getting a um, article in a Google Doc, you copy and paste and you've got all those spans and all that crud. So when you copy and paste it, you either have all those spans and all that crud or you strip it and now you don't have where they want their links, where they want their headings. And so Markdown is a really a good tool for everyone. People can read it and it's easy to paste um, in, into uh, WYSIWYGs. And we have a little bit of Markdown support in core now with CK Editor 5. And then we also have some great new ex uh, modules that help Markdown in Drupal 10. So it's, real, it's coming back and being relevant. And then the how, how does Markdown work? It bridges that gap between technical writers and developers. So again, one statement, you know, that this is our, probably our, our introductory paragraph. I have that who, the what, the how, the why, all in there so when someone starts reading your article, they know right away if this is the article that they want. So no matter where you are in your journey, you know, understanding what you're trying to say is that first step. And you can just keep building from there. Um, at the end of the day, if your audience understands what you're writing or what you're speaking about, then you're on the right track. So we're gonna take some of our topics and narrow them down a little bit. Figuring out what you're trying to write. Um, 
Technical writers um, are experts at translating highly technical subjects into more digestible formats for the end users. So it takes time, it takes learning and skill building um, to become a technical writer. But you don't have to be a professional technical writer to write technically um, and publish your knowledge. So in this section, we're gonna really define what technical articles are and how they're different from documentation. And then we'll do the vice versa on the other, on the flip side of it. So um, technical articles are an informal way to share your technical uh, expertise. It can be about logistics, it can be practice, it can be the science behind a topic, um, or uh, something that requires a fundamental understanding to grasp, to grasp um, or undertake. So they're really informal ways of sharing information. And generally, when we look at technical articles, there's three tips we share with our new authors. Um, we start by writing down three things that it requires to do the thing. Start with threes, groups of threes. If there's more than three steps, cool. You know, you can widen the steps and expand your points into another article. Um, it's under these steps that you would write sub-steps explaining the main step. So think in the terms of threes. You know, if we think about like our school outlines or the way we structure headings, you know, you have your three main topics. And if you have something to say about those, do three more. If you have much more than that, maybe it's, you know, not an article anymore. Maybe it's a reference guide or maybe it's a series of articles. But, you know, our attention spans are short. People don't have a lot of time. So um, the, the concept of three works really well with the way people read articles these days. You want to write a paragraph that introduces why someone is reading your article. Remember that blurb we had? It had all of the things to make sure that people understood and they're not wasting their time. And you want a closing section to close out the conversation to leave the reader with a call to action. So as you do it, you have your introductory article, you've got your three points, and then at the end of those three points, you kind of digest that again. Tell it about it again, and then give them a call to action. Oh, if you want to learn more, go here. Here's what I did next. Or maybe it's a series of articles. Ooh, this is one. This is pretty hard to read, isn't it? Um, okay, so this was an article on opensource.com, and Marjorie broke it down into the three uh, sections. You know, um, here's what it looks like all written out. You can tell he's got an article, the, the title is short and succinct. He's got an opening paragraph. He's got an image because images are great for ROI for articles. And then he breaks down a little bit more and then he's got his three points. So his three points are society and culture, rough resources, infrastructure and economy, and proprietary software needs. So he breaks it down into digestible chunks for people. So now let's look and flip it over and look at how we write technical documentation and how it's a little bit more formal than an article. According to Indeed, um, technical documentation is a more formal style that describes the application purpose, um, creation or architecture of a product or service. So, with technical documentation, we want to be, we want to think of economy of words. We want to eliminate words. We want to be clear, concise, and succinct. We want to be careful of jargon and buzzwords and pop culture because we live in a global society and glo people all over are using our software. So localisms don't always translate from, you know, translation to translation. Um, more specifically, we want to eliminate words that don't directly enhance or support the purpose of our documentation design. We want to use specific nouns. We don't want to use words like thing. Um, that should be eliminated from your lexicon. You should search for thing and just delete that. 
Um, a lack of noun specificity um, can cause confusion. Because what things, um, what people, the sentence lacks meaning because of vague nouns, um, which will force the reader to add extra sentences to themselves to clarify the purpose of what you're saying. You want to really make sure that you strengthen verb phrases. You want to use an active voice versus a passive voice. And I am awful at this. I really have to look and make sure that I have written in an active voice. Because um, verbs are the heart of what your sentences are. Um, when they get watered down, they become weak and again lead to that user confusion. Active voice means that the subject of the sentence is doing the action, and passive voice means that the subject is being acted on. And I'll say that again. Active voice means that the subject is doing the action, and a passive voice means um, that the subject is being acted upon. And when we talk about technical writing, when we write in the passive voice, it goes against the rule of economy of words, too. It takes a lot more words to write passively. And again, it adds to the confusion. We want to avoid walls of text. We want to break down our content um, with bullet points and numbered lists. You know, each point should be brief and easy to understand. They help to prioritize the information that your, that your uh, content consumers are using. Um, and break down those walls of text. Walls of text can be very indigestible. And that, again, and when we're on our phone, when we're on our phone and a wall of text takes two scrolls, you're going to lose your reader. So break it up. You know, use headings. Um, organize the content logically. That's the headings and the subheadings. And this is good for accessibility, too. Um, when we use headings, we structure our content in a way that assistive technology can follow it. So headings aren't just for styling. Headings are for breaking up your content. And again, headings are for assistive technology. If your team has a style guide or, you know, Drupal has a style guide, Drupal has a template that we use, use it. You know, be very clear because, you know, if, um, we're going to you know, um, like I work at the Linux Foundation, so I'm just going to use them. If people go to the Linux Foundation and they're reading technical documentation, and the way it's written changes from page to page, it can be confusing and inaccessible. So if you have a style guide for your project, a style guide for your, for your blog, you know, keep to it or keep the best. Um, you want to familiar your, familiarize yourself um, and reference it when you have questions. Um, it provides rules and guidelines for consistent writing. And sometimes what people will have is they'll have an accessibility guide in there too. So you might not be 100% versed in accessibility, but your style guide will give you some clues to how to keep your content accessible. So for formatting, you know, we talked about this. We have the headings and then we have the subheadings. Um, if your article is longer than 500 words, consider breaking up that text so you don't have a wall of text. You know, we use our H2s and our H3s and our H4s. Typically, that H1 is the title of your page, so we stay away from that. There's some rule or there's one browser where you can use an H1, but generally speaking, we start with an H2. Um, if your article is longer than 1,300 words, you might consider breaking it up into two articles, you know, or making a longer series. When we write interviews, um, we want to make sure that we use bold for the question um, or bold for who's making the statement and the regular formatting for the answers. So you want to have a visual clue and then a semantic clue for a screen reader that it's the question versus the answer. And then inline formatting, you know, um, some, some publications will allow you italics and bolding, but use those sparingly because maybe in the WYSIWYG they're not marked semantically. So if you're using a screen reader, maybe they won't know that it's bolded. So if you use bold, be aware that sometimes only people can see that visually. Code formatting, if your article contains code, please delineate it with a code tag. You know, there's two different ways that you can do it. You can do inline code or you can um, have a, a code block. 
Um, if it's a short piece of code, you know, feel free to leave it in line within the snippet, you know, but those longer chunks should be broken into new lines. Um, we don't recommend using block quotes for code blocks. Also, do not take images of code blocks because you're sharing information in the code block and now you've, your content consumer has lost the ability to copy and paste it. So if you do use an image of a code block for whatever reason, you're gonna have to write it all out in your alt text anyway. So, but again, you know, it gives, it gives your consumer that ability to copy and paste. When you're writing for a publication, um, you wanna be careful about um, underlining for formatting because um, most people associate underlining with text or with uh, links. And if your links aren't underlined, please consider underlining your links. But most of the time for formatting, it is for links and people will recognize it as links and they'll go to it and it's not a link so they get confused. So we wanna um, avoid using that for formatting. When we talk about hyperlinks within the article, um, we wanna make sure that, um, well, it really depends on your style guide, but for accessibility, you wanna make sure that the person knows that they're either staying in the page, opening it in the same window, or if it's opening a different window, you wanna indicate that you're opening it someplace else because it might be disturbing or frustrating for people that don't know what happens when that link opens. So make sure that you, you know, tell folks with a little tab, with a, with a description if it's gonna be opening in a new tab or it's gonna be opening in the same page. And then keep it consistent from page to page. Um, going back to you know, who your content consumer is, um, creating a persona is sometimes a good idea. If you're thinking about who you're writing for, you should ask yourself the reader you're looking for. You know, who's going to read your document? What information would they expect to find? And then evergreen content. You know, when we talk about things like readmes and the technical documentation, um, Evergreen content is really important. We don't want to reference things that have happened in the past or that are going to happen in the future because then it's not relevant anymore. So if you think about that, if you, if you don't have content that's evergreen, you need to keep going back and updating it. So revise and update, you know, because we know that tech changes. So build that into like your development plan of when you're writing things, you know, Build in that time to go back and improve your documentation as you add a feature request, as configuration changes because core changed. Go back there and update. Um, keep your content as fresh as you can. So there's a talk, right? Was there a talk yesterday about AI? Or I don't remember, but um, it's happening now. Okay. So... Some of you know me, some of most of you don't, but I'm very opinionated. I'm very open source. Um, so I do want to talk about the use of AI. A blank page can be a really scary thing and that's okay. And it's okay that you use AI. Um, the AI I'm talking about is beyond using something like Grammarly or spell checkers. What I'm talking about here are writing assistants like chat GPT, I think that's the big one. So I just wanna say a couple of things to keep in mind when you're using these AI tools. One, are they attached to an API and are you sharing your information? So think about when you're using an AI tool and you don't want your information to be on the internet, is it attached to an API, first and foremost? And then AI models are only as good as the data they have access to. So, hey, how much information is totally correct on the internet, you know? Um, so, the governance is always changing. It's different in, the U in, in, in Europe than it is in the United States. Um, when you use AI, all of a sudden it might not be open source anymore. So, where they're pulling from might be proprietary information, like code from a Mazda database and you use it in your home assistance, well, you're going to get in trouble because you just pulled some proprietary code. 
Um, it might not be accurate, then, you know? So really, if you use those AI tools, do your fact checking, go back and s make sure that those resources match and use the content, but be sure that you make it your own through edits. So and that's all I'll say about AI. You can think about all the other stuff, but as writing, you know, keep in mind we're on, working on open source projects and it might not be open source and it's biased too. AI is inherently biased because it only has what it has off the internet. And we all know the internet has biases. Okay, so spelling and grammar. Most of the time, if you're writing for a publication, eh, you, you're gonna have some editors that will help you with it. So, so maybe English isn't your first language and you're a little bit nervous about, you know, putting in your article, or I'm being very American here by saying English, but maybe, you know, you're writing for some, a, a different language that's that, than your first language. Um, you know, it's nice that you go through and you do a copy edit, but know that that editorial team is really rooting for you and they'll help you with some of, some of that stuff. So don't get hung up, you know, if, if, if you're writing for a language that's your second language. The process is expedited if, if you've done like some of that basic stuff, but I wouldn't let that be a hang up. Word count. You know, I talk about word count a little bit. I told you about the 1300 words and stuff like that. And that's a question we get asked a lot about articles. Most of the time we don't worry about word count, so neither should you, you know? Um, but I put together some guidelines just in case people want some guidelines on word count. Oh my gosh, okay, that is not accessible, is it? Um, sorry about that, it looks much different on my computer, um, but I will change that for the next time I give it. And what I mean by accessible is it's really hard to read that, that color on that blue. Okay, so when we have 500 to 600 words, 500 words might be all that you need to provide a project update, announce a conference, or share some sort of timely news story. 600 and 800 words, this might be for reference uh, um, in print, a one to two page article with pictures. So that's what, you know, in print, a magazine, 600 to 800 words would look like. And this is good for your regular article or a column submission, um, an interview or a roundup. Um, consider, you know, adding those subheads to break um, up the text and walk your readers through the section of the article. And then when we move into 800 to 1300 words, these are our how-tos. These are our getting started guides. These are our tutorials, um, you know, our more in-depth roundups, things like that. And then 1300 words, sometimes it's really hard to get all of your information out in less than 1300 words. So don't let that stop you. You know, just think about, you know, how much more how many more words do you have? You know, does it go beyond 1,500 words? Does it go beyond 1,600 words? That's when you might consider breaking it up into two articles. Or if it's a documentation page, making sure that you have maybe break it up into um, uh, configuration and then another page on troubleshooting. You know, break it up because people want those digestible chunks. And it's easier to come into one article than to come into two articles, then to go into one article multiple times to find what you're looking for. I hope that made sense. Okay, images. Um, so we use images both in technical publications and in documentation um, because um, sometimes they enhance what we're learning. Sometimes people don't learn by the written word and those visuals help them you know, digest the information. Um, Inline images and screenshots, they add visual interest too. It breaks up the content. You have a picture to look at. If you have a, a, a hero image and it on Google, people are more likely to click on it with that hero image. They're more return on your investment. Um, if you include images, make sure that they match the license that you're using, that you have permission to use those images. And then if you provide your own images, make sure you declare what kind of licensing you have on, you know, is it Creative Commons? Can people share it? Most of the time, if we're writing for open source, we just open source everything. But make sure that you can share that image and give attribution.
So I just said this, um, include image credits and license details when you submit your drafts to folks. That way they can look up and make sure that that image belongs to you or they have permission to use it. Um, when you submit your images, submit them as files or attachments. Um, they should never be inside your draft. Maybe re make reference in your draft to where that you want the images placed, but it's easier for editors to have those outside of the draft. It's easier when you submit um, your readme or your technical documentation to drupal.org. It's easier for the person entering that content to have them separate. It's hard to extract images sometimes from things. Um, your images should be no wider than a site's columns width, um, and usually that's about 600 pixels. There's tools out there, GIMP, you can put in an image and you can use GIMP and with a few clicks, you can reduce that image size to fit. Um, and then when you do manipulate that image, make sure that it looks good after manipulation. Um, we, don't, um, we don't want it to be pixelated or blurred or, or too big, because think about loading. You know, I might be in Mexico and I'm reading an article, and if you have a real, heavy, real uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, large image, it might not load in time. You know, and it's the same as not having an image at all. Um, use labels when you submit your, your images so that your editors know where to put them. Add captions if they're applicable. Um, be sure to reference in your article where the caption should go. You know, if you do this, put the caption at the bottom. Um, provide alternative text. Now, it might just be a picture of a big red barn, right? So what would you put? Big red barn. But depending on the context of your article, that big red barn might just be a big red barn, but it might be a big red barn sitting in a field with bombs exploding around it. So not all alt text is the same. So think about that. And what you think the alt text should be might read differently than what I see. So if you have some sort of emotion or you want to get something out in that image or provoke it, you're providing more context, that editor might not know that. So provide as much of that as you can. Oh, Marjorie put this in here. <laughs> I can talk for hours and hours about captions and alt text. Um, yeah, anyway, thanks Marjorie. Um, <laughs> decorative images are weird, okay? Why is it in there if it's a decorative image? Are you evoking emotion? If you're evoking emotion, why would you not describe it to a person who can't see it? I'll leave it at that. So, links. Um, usually links are um, approved by the, by the periodical you're um, submitting to. If the primary purpose of your article is all about backlinks to your organization, is, is that really great content to share? You know, think about that, you know. Um, do they folk, you know, who are you submitting to? Do they focus on stories about open source products, technologies, communities, or products? You know, although a product pitch is okay, it's not a good fit for every site. Maybe you have a product pitch and it's a great, it's a great thing. Maybe just use one link back to how they can get to you at the bottom. But the whole links inside people feel, it's not a good feeling for people when it's a product pitch. That's you know, all about getting them back to your website. Save that stuff for Medium or LinkedIn. So include links to open source products or Wikipedia pages, you know, describing the project when you're first mentioning it. Maybe it's, you know, you're using DDEV. Well, the article's not about DDEV, but you need to add some context, you know, link back right there at the first, we'll link it once so they have the context and leave it at that. Um, explain the link to other um, open source licensing. So, um, you know, uh, if you're writing an article about Drupal, but MongoDB, you know, they have two different licensing, so link back to licensing and things like that. 
And then include links to technical ideas and terms that may not be known to a non-technical audience because not everyone is gonna be technical reading your article. So if there's a big concept in there, do people, because you don't wanna explain the concept in your article because that's not what the article's about, but you wanna be able to provide context for people that don't know about that specific thing. So again, you know, link, link appropriately. So now what? When creating an article, there's certain key things that we think about. You know, the first thing is a title. You don't have to start with a title, but sometimes that's how people work. So um, after that, you wanna create an outline, and the outline has an introduction, it has a body, we talk about you know, key elements, and then when you wrap up your article and call to actions. So titles, usually we talk about this first. You don't have to do it first. You know, sometimes the inspiration for a title comes later. Um, you want a good title for your article. You want it to be catchy, playful, yet explanatory. But we need to be careful of too clever of titles, right? Um, what you might think of as quippy might not go over, you know, it might not translate well. You know, like I said, certain pop culture references are great for one localization, but don't carry over. Um, and try to create a title that can stand out on its own so you don't get too caught up with the headlines. And then think of search engine optimization. Um, when we're doing contributions and we're doing our issue summaries and our issue titles, we keep them clear, tight, and concise. That way when other people have that issue, they can search the issue queue. Same idea with an article. If we're gonna keep those words clean and concise and what you think people would use to search for whatever topic. So an example we use sometimes, does she have that in here? No. Um, like we had a, a, a session submission one year for Florida camp that was like PHP and elephants. And some of the people were like, well, what does that mean? You know, so like some of us know what that means, but others don't. So, you know, it's a neat title if you know, but some people would just skip over it. So just be aware of those two clever of titles. And then we want to keep politics out of the titles too, you know, anything like that. So the outline, you know, um, be clear about what it's about. What are you gonna cover in the introduction? Why does it matter? We wanna pique the interest. You know, again, we wanna make sure that those people reading that first paragraph really know what they're getting into. Um, give them an escape route by giving them as much information as you can. Um, and who's it aimed at? Those W's and that H. And the body, um, you know, we break it down into those threes. So we have the main topics in our story headings. You know, um, maybe the main point of what you want to have, have that be first. Think about that, you know, like don't be flowery and that sort of thing. Just go in and tell people what you want. Um, what are some examples or supporting points to illustrate your, more, your, your main point? And then, Logical flow changes as you write your article too. So give yourself some grace as you're writing your articles that you're like, oh, none of this makes sense. It's in the wrong order. Sometimes all it does is like finishing the article to have that aha moment of putting it back into order. You might have to change a heading or something like that, but don't get hung up on keeping exactly to your outline. So if we write an article about a module, and again, this is just an example, you know, um, looking at those points, you know, who is that project for? We're writing about a module. What does the project solve? Why was the project created? What solution are you providing? How does it work? When would you use it? And where would you use it? So that's just applying that to like a, you know, you wrote a theme or you wrote a module. But you know, those are the questions most of your content consumers are gonna be looking for. So, 
For a conclusion, um, we had that introduction paragraph, right? We talked about all of the things we wanted to talk about. That conclusion might be two paragraphs, but you're going to remind your consumer of what you wrote about. You're going to remind them of the details. It won't look quite the same as the introduction, but you're going to leave them some, with some key points to remember. Because sometimes at the end, after you've digested information, being reminded of what you just learned, and that one of those sentences, you're like, did I learn that? And it gives a person an opportunity to go back and make sure that they learned all of their things. But really, you want to answer that so what question. Why does it matter? Why did they just read your article? The so what factor. And this might be a place to um, have your bio. And we talked about like links to agencies or links back to your organizations or links to things. A bio is a place where you can link back. You know, you know, I'm Amy June and I work for the Linux Foundation and that's my link. And so sometimes you can use those, those bios um, to give people your contact information or a little bit more context, you know. So if there's something that, if there's something that sort of says why you're qualified to write that bio. Like, who am I to talk about accessibility? And you might want to list some reasons. You know, who am I to talk about the media module? So your bio might change from article to article, too. And accessibility tips. Um, you um, never want to assume that everyone will consume a resource in the same way. So think about that. Not all of us read articles. Some of us use text readers. Some of us use um, a keyboard to access the information. Um, so not, of, not all of us know all the acronyms. So define acronyms, numerums, and abbreviations. So the first time you use something like BLM, you would spell out Bureau of Land Management or Black Lives Matter and then put it in the, the quotes because there's two different acronyms there. Bureau of Land Management, depending if you're over 80 years old, or Black Lives Matter, you know, so define, define your acronym before you use it. A numeram is something like accessibility or internationalization, I, 18N, 18 letters in between, but not everyone knows that, so define internationalization. I18N and then use I18N in the rest of your um, article. Use predefined reading levels. Um, the usability.gov, and I think there's one in the UK too, um, suggests writing at the ninth grade reading level. Now you might have specific audiences or white papers where you're reading level might go up, but we suggest that you write at the ninth grade reading level because m there's more people at the ninth grade reading level than at the collegiate reading level. And that goes back to like breaking down your words, making sure it's understand. Again, there's exceptions because you have white papers or a medical paper, but you know, also as a group, like if it's an article f that you run with a company or you ask them what their predefined reading level is. You want to use clear fonts and avoid special characters. So not everyone knows what the ampersand is, so just use the and. You know, I know some of us will use economy like when we're doing our social media posts and stuff, but in an article or talk documentation, we want to really cut down those special characters because they don't always translate globally. Um, <laughs> avoid emoticons and ASCII art. Um, because if you use a screen reader, a screen reader will read every single one of those things in line. Like they're really cute to look at, but you have a like a, I'm just going to use Twitter because I hate it or whatever it's called now. You've got a, a post and it's talking about like a graduation, but every other in between each word is like an emoji. That screen reader is going to read that one word, the emoji, the one word, the emoji, the one read. So. If you do that in an article, you're going to lose your content consumers really fast. And then ASCII art, they're going to read all of those slashes, all of those back ticks, all of those. So in a README, like it was really cool and you have this great cat, it, it's really going to frustrate some of your, your people using assistive technology. So some parting tips that Marjorie leaves us. Um, we write to one person, so we use a singular. Um, it's not we, it's not let's, it's you or the user. 
we write as if the reader is doing the task right now. So no will, no should, no could. You're writing it as if they're doing the task right now. And then you write for one clear result. You're teaching, you're persuading, you're enlightening your reader about one idea. Bonus tips don't really count towards that idea of three. So if you have like this kind of tangential thing that's like, oh, I really want to share that, you can kind of, you know, there's, you know, exceptions to every rule. And then try typing your topic into a search engine to see what people are saying about it. What are people, what are people searching for? You know, what, like, you know, you look at your article and you think, oh, this might be incomplete. Type in those search words and see what people are searching for. And then use Markdown. <laughs> and I have a little bit of an introduction to Markdown. We've got a few minutes left. Does anyone have any questions before I kind of like do a little bit of a Markdown demo? That's okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, um, Before we move into the demo, I want to, uh, well, in light of a prominent community sponsor here at DrupalCon, I want to remind people to be sure to read your host accessible, uh, acceptable use policy and make sure it aligns with your values and goals. And that's all I have to say about that. If you want to ask me more, you can ask me after the recording's off because they are sponsoring this camp. Okay. So why Markdown? Um, Markdown's cool. PDFs are a dredge. PDFs, why do we even have PDFs? Like, why do they exist in this day and age? They're portable documents, but they're not accessible. You can't copy and paste from them. They're the most, they're just pieces of junk, right? Do not submit things in PDFs. A Google Doc is better than a PDF, okay? That's how bad PDFs are. Um, so one of the things about Markdown is um, it's really plain text formatting, but it allows, well, no, it's, it's a cross between plain text formatting and HTML. So it kind of bridges the gap. It allows you to have more control over your editorial view of what your article looks like. You can add headings, you can add links, you can add borders, you can add Flow charts, ooh. Um, so, the, and they're very human readable. You know, like I said, you can submit an article to maybe someone who's not technical on your marketing team or maybe your, your intern who can't read HTML, but it can be converted to HTML. It's portable from different technology to different technology as well. ASCII doc is cool too, and Drupal.org references using ASCII doc, but I've never seen anything on Drupal.org written in ASCII doc. Has anybody? No, okay, because it's still up there that says submit your stuff in ASCII doc, okay. They're like, you know. Okay, so why use Markdown? It's because it's cool. Um, it's intuitive, it's portable, it can be converted to HTML, it can also be converted to a PDF, um, but using Markdown is like using an editor without having to use the buttons, you know, like when I'm typing real fast, like my finger does not reach some of those buttons. So, um, to like up at the top of the WYSIWYG, say I'm like down. So I have to like, almost like put my, I have to like take my fingers off the keyboard, go to the mouse, go to the button, you know, where it, where Markdown's just keystrokes. So it, it, it's accessible to people who maybe don't use a, a mouse. Maybe it's accessible for people who's, you know, have a palsy or something like that. I already said this earlier, but um, it's now in core. So that's kind of cool. So it's still relevant. Mike Anello just wrote a Markdown module called Easy Markdown. I don't know if, I know that I didn't um, move some of my sites over because Markdown wasn't available because Mark Conray did an excellent job with the Markdown module, but it never got ported to Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 and Drupal 10. It was a very big 
he was a very gracious fellow and took every feature request. And it just was really, really big. So Mike Anello um, did a, an, a, a, a very straightforward markdown module just recently, and it's called Easy Markdown. So I've been using that, and it's great. Um, it works everywhere. Um, it, it, it's good for almost every editor across platforms. You can use it in Linux. You can use it on Macs. You can use it on Windows. Um, and I already, I already said all this stuff, so I'll just skip it. So applying the basics to Markdown. So you start with an MD file. So most of us, you know, when we do text documents, do the TXT file. But if we write Markdown in a TXT file, it won't render. So we're going to let our editor know that it's a Markdown file. So you start with that MD file. You also have to sort of pick a flavor of Markdown. If you're not familiar with it, different places have different flavors. They're like dialects. We have GitHub Markdown. We have GitLab Markdown. We have Common Markdown. So kind of pick your Markdown flavor, and then make sure that you have an editor that helps you render it. So do some, a little bit of homework um, on that. Um, VS Codium is a great open source um, editor, you know, because VS Code is not open source, just so you all know. So VS Codium doesn't track you, but it has a, the ability that you can write your markdown on one side and it renders, you can pop out a window so you can see what it's going to render. So that's kind of cool. So find a good editor. Um, here's some open source editors. You know, I mentioned VS Codium um, because that's an IDE that a lot of folks use, um, VS Code. Uh, Joplin's another great one. Atom's OK. It's more bare bones. Not so cool editors. These are the ones that aren't open source, um, but they work good. Obsidian is a really cool editor, but it's not open source and they use your information. So I can't recommend it. So it's on the not cool list, but if it does like mind map kind of stuff, playing around with it is cool. I've been asking for years for someone to write an open source version of Obsidian. Um, but it's not open source, but like I said, it's worth mentioning because it, it is, it is kind of cool or not so cool. So these are some of the things I think that we're going to talk about. Let's see where we're at. We've got eight minutes. Um, do you want to look at a GitHub repository and look at like how kind of straightforward Markdown is? Okay. So I have to change just a little bit. I have to um, So I have a GetLab repository. Amy Jean Heinlein, and it's marked down in minutes, and I've got some files, and I'm just going to kind of open some of these the best I can, being on a different screen. Footnotes is in progress, so we're not going to look at footnotes. Oh, shoot. Well, that's opening a new window, so we'll look at headings first. So this is GitLab. As you can see, it's rendered, but if you want to look at the code, you just come over here and look at the code. So there's a couple of different ways you can write headings. You know, we if we look again and we switch over, we had that real nice styling, right? But it's pretty straightforward. It's a, a hashtag with a space and a heading. So hashtag and a space. And as we work down our headings, you add hashtags. So our heading one is one hashtag. Our heading two is two hashtags and so forth. And then alternatively, there's a way that you can write an H1 and an H2. And we do this in most of our, read, our readmes in Drupal is we use this style where we have heading one with equal signs and heading two with dashes. So if we go back and we look at it, we've got our heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, heading five. And all we had to do was add a hashtag as we went. And then GetLab styles it with a horizontal rule. I don't know why they do that. But um, horizontal rules are basically three dashes. So if you look at it, three dashes is our bottom horizontal rule. 
So we'll close this one and look at some of the other ones. Code blocks, we talked about two different kinds of code blocks. We talked about inline formatting and we talked about code blocks. It's real hard to see, but inline code. You've got a little shadow. Can you see that it's got a little bit of a highlight behind it? And then you, we have code blocks. And these are styled different ways depending on where you are, but it's got it in a block. And sometimes you'll see it in, in, the, in, the, in, in the highlighted too. But if we just look at the, how we wrote it, our inline code is one tick, what we want inside of it, followed by, or back tick. So we've got a back tick, our word, and the back tick. And then to do a code block, you've got three back ticks on one line, followed by what you want in the code block, and then finished with three back ticks. So we'll look at that real quick. So in line with the one back tick, three back ticks, and again, we do code blocks because they're easily copy and pasteable. What else did I have up here? I'm just kind of showing the cool ones that not all, everyone knows about. Um, oh, we broke this in, in Minneapolis. <laughs> but um, here's a flow diagram. Like, I don't have to pull out my Figma editor. I don't have to do a bunch of stuff I don't know how to do. Again, we broke it, and I haven't changed my demo since then. But if you look at the code part, you announce a library. Oh, we, 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 we broke a table before. So the stuff on the top is a table that we broke. But the, the stuff that starts with mermaid here is our flow chart. So we're telling it to graph it. We're saying going from A to D, B to D, D to C. So if we look back, you can see A to D, B to D, D to C. So pretty straightforward, it's accessible, you know, um, your alternative text is included when you do this, so um, you don't have to think about it, but um, we had a cool table. Oh, I forgot about that. This one person in this last uh, time I gave the demo wanted to break everything. <laughs> like what happens if you put a table and a flow chart and then you do this? Um, so what's another good one? Lists, lists are good. Um, I'll do lists and I'll do tables just because, like I said, um, most people don't know that you can do, and maybe we won't necessarily go over like exactly how to do it, but you can see that it can be done because I've got two minutes. Okay, so we did flow charts, we look at lists. Lists can be do, done in a couple different ways. To create an ordered list, you do one, two, three, and four, or you can just do whatever numbers you want because when you flip over um, Markdown, we'll put them in order for you. So see what it did? We had one, 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 and then it flips over to one, two, three, four. So that's an ordered list. Unordered lists you can do in a couple of different ways. You can use dashes, asterisks, or plus signs. So here's, they all look the same here. But if we look at the, at the code, we have dashes, asterisks, or plus signs. Maybe the plus sign is easier for you to use, so that's why you use pluses over asterisks. There's no reason why you do one over the other except for preference. And then the last one down here is combining the two. So I have some ordered lists here, and then I have some bullets inside. So if we look at the rendered, you can see that you can combine the two. So we have an ordered list with some bullets in between. Again, just using those pluses, minuses, and asterisks. And then the last one is a table. Hopefully it's not broken. Great, it's not broken. Look at this. You can do a table in Markdown. Cool, it's accessible and pretty straightforward. So I have pipes, you know, it's that key on the left, right hand side of the keyboard, it's pipe symbol. I have a table and then I define my tables. We're gonna look at it a little bit. We have these colons here. See how the colons are on the left side here? These are left aligned. We have the colons on the right side, so these are right aligned. And then we have colons on both sides. Those are center aligned. 
So if we flip over, we can see the columns that are left, the columns that are right, and the columns that are centered. So pretty straightforward. It's just where you put that colon determines where that um, table's going to be. Tables do not have to have information in them, but then they're no longer accessible because a screen reader doesn't know what to do with that spot. But it's an option for you. And then you can like change it up too. You don't have to have everything on the left or the right hand side. So if we flip over and look at that code, you can see we spiced it up. You know, we have, you know, one column is on the left, one column's in the middle, and one column's on the right. So that might be something for styling, you know, that helps people read. Um, one thing to mention about when you center align things, if the text is really long in a table, it makes it centered. And that's not always easy for people to read because it doesn't have a clear one side. So if it's just one word, you can center it or a couple words. But if you have a big block of text for accessibility, keep it to the to whatever side of the page that, that is, your language is written in. And then one last one that's just cool. Look at this. This is a task list where you can like check off things. And of course, I, I do something where I like show you all how to do strike throughs and stuff like that if I had time. But if we look at the code, it's just a kind, kind of a combination of everything. We have a completed task. Um, to do strike through in Markdown, it's a tilde on both sides of the word. And so we filled in our test list with tilde and it crossed it out. So it's just the, you know, the power of it is spectacular. There's a lot of things that you can do without even having to use your WYSIWYG buttons. Oh, this one's kind of cool too. You can do a drop down. Look at that. In Markdown. And I'll just show you the code. So we have details and a summary, you know, our answers, and then, you know, a drop down. And there's other things that you can do to drop downs. You can like make it a radio button and things like that in Markdown. But these are just like, that's the power of Markdown. Like I said, you don't have to have an editor. You just have a Markdown file and you render it. And it's a great way to kind of um, human readable. That's the important part too, right? You know, and it converts it to HTML. So you have your styling and you have control over it and it formats it in HTML, which renders it on your browser. So three minutes over, sorry folks. So, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, and the Markdown repository, like feel free to play around. It's like Amy, Amy June Heinlein, if you find like my repository, it's marked down in minutes. And there's a whole bunch of different pages that you can look at and flip between, you know, how to strike down things, how to, how to make things bold, how to make things, you know, um, italicized. So, yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.